Welcome to Seminar 8 about God's time prophecy. And this is very interesting because it shows us why God would reveal the ark in our days and where we are in God's timeline. We're going back to the time right before the first temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. In Judea, there was a man named Daniel who was taken captive to Babylon along with other young men children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the chaldeans now daniel was one of these men favored to serve the king of babylon however daniel wasn't among those israelites that had turned away from god he tried his best to remain faithful to God's commandments and principles while he was in Babylon. He obtained a high position in the country, and when Babylon was conquered by the Medio persians Daniel continued to have favor with the new kings and maintained his respected position. God cared for Daniel because of his faithfulness, and when Daniel noticed that the time prophecy given to Jeremiah, it was reaching its fulfillment, and then he started praying, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God, to seek by prayer and supplication, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession. So Daniel prays for God to show mercy on his chosen city Jerusalem, and the ruins there. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And while he is praying, the angel Gabriel comes to help Daniel understand the future. So God gave Daniel a time prophecy for telling the coming of the Messiah. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even, it tr even in troublous times, and after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now the book of Daniel contains several prophetic insights, which is why Bible critics claim the book must have been written long after the time of Daniel. So they deny the prophecies by claiming much of it was written after the predicted events happened. However, it's impossible even for Bible critics to place the book of Daniel later than 160 BC, because we know historically that they did have this book at that time. So Daniel had no way of knowing the time, for instance, Yeshua would come and change the world. So in this prophecy we learn when to start counting the years, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. In the book of Ezra we learn that the final order to restore and build Jerusalem come from the Persian leader in the autumn of 457 BC. And as we mentioned, God sometimes uses a day to represent a year in Bible prophecy. We know God used a day for a year in Daniel's prophecy as no Messiah came 69 literal weeks after the command to restore Jerusalem. But if you use the year-day principle, amazingly the time ends up right at the time Yeshua started his work. So the prophecy divides the 70 weeks like this. It starts with the command to rebuild Jerusalem. Then there is 7 weeks. The temple is finished. Then another 62 weeks. Messiah comes. And at the end there is 1 week. Messiah is according to Daniel to be cut off in the middle of the last week. So going from 457 BC and 7 weeks and then 62 weeks when the Messiah were to come brings us to the year 27 AD. 
According to the Bible, Yeshua was around 30 when his ministry began. We know he was not actually born in the year zero because King Herod, who tried to kill Yeshua when he was born, died in the year 4 BC, thus placing Yeshua's birth around 4 BC. This would mean Yeshua was in his early 30s, just as the time prophecy given to Daniel correctly predicts. Now, according to the documents of the New Testament, Yeshua wasn't known until he came forth at his baptism, placing the time prophecy right when Yeshua was anointed into his work at baptism. In the same way, Israel entered the Promised Land in the following way. The ark went before them into the Jordan River. Then the river was cut off, opening a way for the Israelites to walk across. When all the Israelites had passed over, then the ark was taken the rest of the way. Now we know that both the two uh, occasions, Yeshua's baptism and the ark crossing, happened in the same southeastern area of the Jordan River. Just like the Lord's throne entering Jordan opened the way for the Israelites to cross safely into the promised land, in the same way, Yeshua's baptism was the beginning of the work to open a way for people to enter the promised land in heaven. Now, according to scripture, baptism is symbolic of death and resurrection. Death as you are taken down into the water and resurrection when you surface, a new birth. And it's symbolic of Yeshua's death and resurrection that we must partake in in order to get access to the heavenly promised land. So the two events are prophetically connected in showing God's plan of salvation. And if you add these two events happening here in the Jordan River together at the same time, you'll have Yeshua performing the symbol of his death right where the ark opened for God's people to cross. And remember, when Christ died on the cross, the way to the most holy in the earthly sanctuary was ripped open. Through his obedience, they are saved. He paid the penalty the law required to pardon and free us so we could safely cross the river of death. Remember, the water only was cut off as the presence of the Lord and his throne entered the river, and so the waters didn't open for the Israelites, it opened for the Lord, and as long as he was in the river, they could cross. And so the ark would not be moved until everyone had crossed the river. In the same way, the merit of Christ's death and resurrection is our only reason and way to gain life. It's the only opening given us to cross into the heavenly promised land. So I personally don't think the choice of Yeshua's baptism, being where the Israelites once crossed, is accidental. Instead, it confirmed God's character, his plan, and his gospel. And the path of the ark and Yeshua seems to be connected in several ways, as we will also show in later episodes. So the timeline, pointing to when Christ started his ministry after baptism, might be correct. So let's get back to the timeline. The time prophecy doesn't end with Messiah coming forth. There is one more prophetic week of the 70 weeks, which is seven more years of the 490 years. It says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the obligation to cease. And verse 26 also says Messiah will be cut off or his life taken. Now in the remaining week Messiah would cause the sacrifice to cease. According to the New Testament, something happened when Christ died on the cross, ending the sacrificial laws as a means to atonement. Astoundingly, if you go from Christ's baptism to the middle of the remaining week, we land at the exact time Yeshua died. Because according to the witnesses of the four Gospels, Yeshua had only about three and a half years of ministry from when he was baptized until he was killed. So Daniel was given a prophecy foretelling the first coming of the Messiah. Remember also God stated that they had a probationary time until the end of this prophecy. Surprisingly, what happened at the end of the prophecy was the stoning of Stephen and rejection of the disciples, the last rejection of the message of Yeshua's death and resurrection. 
So God didn't end the probation with Christ's death, but gave them new chances through the work of the disciples. The disciples had to endure prosecution and even prison, but when Stephen was stoned, it marked the time the Jews decided it was a death penalty to preach about Yeshua. God then began slowly withdrawing his protection from Israel. Thus, at this time, the Jewish followers of Yeshua got a call to not only preach to the Jews, but to start preaching to the Gentiles. So this book foretold the future so accurately in regard to Yeshua's coming and the events around it that it's impossible to overlook, and this hundreds of years before it actually happened. And remember, there was no one else at this time who fits this time prophecy and had such a powerful and lasting message as Yeshua. He is the only Jewish teacher who has reached the very ends of the world, from the tiny islands of the Pacific to the largest cities of the world. This is no accident or coincidence. The exact time was predicted when Yeshua would be cut off, and he being the greatest and most far-reached Jewish teacher who ever lived. Now let's go back to God's plan of salvation shown in the feast days. We have the spring Sabbath and the autumn Sabbath, and Daniel's time prophecy points to the exact time when the fulfillment of the spring Sabbath started, at Christ's death. If Daniel's time prophecy gives us a clue to when the spring Sabbaths would occur, and the time prophecy shows when Yeshua would die, which is connected to the first spring Sabbath, then the question is, if Daniel was shown when the spring Sabbaths would occur, would he then also be shown when some of the autumn feast days would be fulfilled? Remember the time prophecy only lead to one of the spring feast days. Perhaps Daniel was shown the time leading to one of the autumn feast days. As Messiah's first mission is portrayed in the time prophecy, would God also let us know when Messiah's finishing work started? Because both the beginning and ending of Yeshua's work for our salvation are connected in the Lord's plan of salvation as shown in the feast day Sabbaths. So the plan of salvation is shown in the seven feast days stretching over seven months. The events represented by the spring feasts were foretold through the prophet Daniel. Then there is a long gap until the autumn feasts in the seventh month. Do we find a similar pattern in the book of Daniel? You see, the messianic prophecy is not the first time prophecy given to Daniel. The first time prophecy given to Daniel is found in chapter 8, the chapter before. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint which spoke, How long shall be the vision concerning the sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel is given a vision of the future, with many more details than just this time prophecy, and the angel explains the other elements of the vision. But when it comes to the part of the prophecy regarding the time, the angel offers no explanation at all. He only says, The vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be of many days. This time prophecy was to be sealed up, but nevertheless, Daniel seems a bit puzzled by it all. Will it be such a long time before Jerusalem is restored? You see, it's after this, in chapter 9, he starts reading Jeremiah prophesying they will return after 70 years. So why then a new time prophecy? Daniel may have been confused, and so he prays earnestly for his people as he thinks God has postponed the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Perhaps he was worried it was because they were not properly converted. God does not leave Daniel in despair because of the new time prophecy of the 2,300 mornings and evenings. And he shows him how it's not contradicting Jeremiah's prophecy. Nor does he leave Daniel with the impression that the prophecy given to Jeremiah won't be fulfilled. So Gabriel comes back to Daniel to explain further. And that's when he learns of the messianic time prophecy that we mentioned in the start of this episode. Notice the following. Daniel hasn't been given any new vision, 
after the time prophecy of the 2,300 days. The last vision given to Daniel was already explained by the angel Gabriel. The only part the angel didn't explain was the 2,300 evenings and mornings. And this is also the part that would leave Daniel in confusion because it didn't match Jeremiah's prophecy. So the angel returns to Daniel despite there being no new vision, but just to explain the last vision as it confused Daniel. But the time prophecy was declared to be sealed up, so the angel does not mention the end of this prophecy at all. Instead, he relieves Daniel by explaining that the restoration of Jerusalem occurs at the beginning of the time prophecy and not the end of it. He says, Seventy weeks are de determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now the word used is shatak, which means to cut off. So seventy of the weeks were cut off or separated off from this time prophecy to be explained to Daniel and his people. The rest of the time prophecy, just like the angel had said, was to be sealed up and therefore remain unexplained. If the 70 weeks are the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy, then we have the key to understanding when the 2300 days end. And if the 2300 days are linked with the 70 weeks, then we continue with the day for a year principle and find that the time prophecy ends in the middle of the 19th century AD. So the question is, if the end of the first prophecy foretold the spring feast days, did the end of this prophecy reveal something about the autumn feast days? There is, after all, a significant similarity here. The feast day Sabbath are ordered like this, with a long time gap between the spring and autumn feast days, and it is the same with the time prophecy, from the end of the 70 weeks until the end of the 2300 year days. There is a long time gap with apparently no prophetic time concerning the work of the Messiah. So we have Messiah doing something at the conclusion of the first part of the time prophecy and Messiah doing something at the very end of the time prophecy as a whole. There are more pieces that fit together that we will still go through. You see, the first prophecy in the book of Daniel explained the coming kingdoms that will suppress God's people until God's kingdom is to take over. It's illustrated with a statue, a head of gold symbolizing the kingdom of Babylon, the breast of silver symbolizing the Medo-Persian kingdom, and bronze representing the Greek imperium, and finally the Roman kingdom, the Iron Kingdom, that is later divided. Whilst it is divided into different tribes, God will come and break these powers and restore his own. In the book of Daniel, the future is explained again and again but with new information added each time. The first statue covers the time of Daniel to the coming of God's kingdom, so it sets the time frame within which all the other prophecies are placed. God later reveals the future power, depicting them as beasts, all with characteristics that reveal even more detail about them. This time the fourth kingdom, representing the iron kingdom of the statue, the kingdom that is to be divided, shows the same characteristics. Out of the fourth beast's head grows ten horns, just like the ten toes, and the feet and toes were partly iron. In the same way, we see that these horns are connected to the fourth beast. Although the book of Daniel doesn't say that the fourth beast or kingdom was the Roman Empire, Yeshua himself ties the prophecy of Daniel to the Roman Empire by placing it in the future when Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. In chapter 8, Daniel is shown the future kingdoms once again this time with even more information than the previous two visions. What we learn from these three visions is that there will be a power that will fight against God and his saints and who will change times and laws. This power will arise from the ashes of the Roman Empire but, albeit to a lesser extent, still be a kind of continuation of that power that once destroyed the Second Temple. Now the only power today that took over the titles of the Roman Emperor responsible for the destruction of the Second Temple, are the popes in Vatican State. They have taken the titles of the high priests of the Roman Emperor, Pontifex Maximus and Father of the People. They don't have the kingdom that the Roman Emperor had, but the papacy was a continuation of their power and seat. The Bible says that this power would arise after the Roman Empire, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. 
This is actually what the popes did. Each pope magnified himself even to the prince of hosts by claiming they were the voice of Christ, his representative on earth. At the same time, this power was responsible for casting down the truth to the ground by removing the gospel from its Jewish roots and replacing it with paganism. They changed God's law, thus placing their authority above God's, distorting the mission of the Messiah who was to bring people into harmony with God's law. So what we see here is the same as in the book of Revelation. It says in several places that someone whose spirit and teachings come from the head of gold, Babylon, has deceived a multitude of God's people, and God is telling them to get out of there if he is to spare their lives. Remember his message to the churches standing at the candlestick. He warns them of a coming judgment among his own people. The book of Revelation is full of warnings for people who have been deceived into following false Christs and false false prophets, and if they don't flee from it, they will receive God's plagues. So in the book of Daniel, immediately after warning us about this power, we are introduced to the time prophecy of the 2,300 days. That's because the 2,300 days shows us how this power is casting down the truth to the ground while magnifying himself against the prince. Then an angel asked, how long? He says, how long? Will the sanctuary and the host be trodden underfoot? The answer comes unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this time prophecy relates to a time of judgment when God will restore the truth after it had been suppressed and will cleanse the sanctuary. Now in the Old Covenant, the sanctuary was cleansed once a year on the great day of atonement. This is when the high priest entered the most holy place where the ark was. Those who had not humbled themselves by then were separated from his people. So there is an investigation and subsequent judgment separating the true followers with the ungodly. When we read the parallel to this prophecy in chapter 7, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancients of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. A fierce stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. It explains that this takes place during the life of the blasphemous horn that comes out of the beast, and it ends while the blasphemous power is still alive and deceiving people with his words. So again, just like the feast days, we are shown that there will be an investigative judgment before Yeshua's second coming, the judgment before the harvest. He will cleanse the people before he comes, which will determine who is holy and who is unholy before he comes. In the Revelation, we see the fall feasts again in eschatology. In the Bible, the word trumpet isn't actually in the feast of the trumpets. The word translated trumpet meaning is a loud noise then after that is the day of atonement and then sukkot and then the final seventh feast day sabbath revelation 14 explains that prior to christ's second coming there will be an angel bearing a message with a loud voice a warning this is consistent with the feast of trumpets that forewarned the day of atonement the angel then gives the message for the hour of his judgment is come the next feast was sukkot where fruit was harvested with its branches. The next scene in Revelation is the angels warning that a judgment has already begun and Christ's second coming, where he's shown to have in his hand a sharp sickle. So God is explaining the order of the feast days with Christ's mission in several ways, over and over again. So Yeshua's final movement as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary are to warn people and the churches, as in the Feast of Trumpets, to turn away from deception, false doctrine, and sinful behavior before he comes, and then a judgment begins. Then after that, he comes to harvest. Thus the book of Revelation is largely warning us of a coming judgment and an attempt to cleanse the people to be ready for it. Another way to see how it all fits together is by the Sabbath year. As I mentioned in the previous chapter, if you count one violated Sabbath year for every 7,000 years, the earth is sin-affected. You end up with 1,000 years when the earth will have to be left desolate. 
for the 2,300-year time prophecy ending in the middle of the 19th century actually places Yeshua's final work right before the harvest, just before the end of the 6,000 years. While the Bible says we won't know the day or the hour of Christ's coming, it doesn't say that we won't know if we are living in the last days of the earth history. So for Yeshua to start the autumn Sabbaths or autumn feast days at the end of the 2,300 years in the mid-19th century is perfectly in harmony with the rest of the Bible and the plan of salvation as shown in the Torah. Another factor that fits with this cleansing is that Daniel was told to seal the time vision up until the end times. It is fascinating how this time prophecy of 2,300 years received attention all over the world precisely in the mid-19th century. Unfortunately, a large group of people in the United States thought the time prophecy ended with Christ's second coming, that the cleansing would take place then. They didn't harmonize the 2,300-year prophecy with the plan of salvation revealed in the sanctuary service and in the feast days. Otherwise, they would have known the cleansing work of the high priest was done before Yeshua could put away his priestly garments and come back as king. So when Christ didn't return after the time prophecy ended, they were mocked and ridiculed, but the attention this time prophecy received across the whole world is worthy of note. Many didn't understand what it meant. Due to the Dark Ages, Christians were terribly uninformed in the Torah and they didn't understand things in the full light of God's word and testimony. But remember, God's plan for the ending of this time prophecy was not just to cleanse the sanctuary, but also to restore the truth that had been trodden underfoot. Not surprisingly, what happened in the years after the time prophecy ended was a reformation movement, not like the reformation after the Dark Ages, because that didn't quite go far enough. After the mid-19th century, many groups of Christians started returning to their roots. They did away with the counterfeit law fabricated by the Pope and replaced it with God's law as it was written. They started respecting the Torah and sanctifying the Sabbath. The Reformers' logo for their first outreach magazine was the Ark of the Covenant, signifying that they were reforming towards God's covenant and law and that all men were being judged by it. Their main goal was to sound a trumpet, a warning before Christ's second coming, and to call on people to prepare and go back to the biblical faith in the Advent. The work had great impact. Because of this small movement, a little over 150 years ago, there are now millions of Christians worldwide that respect God's law and refuse to make graven images so often seen in the Catholic churches. Furthermore, they sanctified the true Sabbath of the Bible and refused to eat unclean meat. From these large groups and denominations, the Reformation back to the Judean Christian roots continues for many. How could it all fit so perfectly? A time prophecy that was given to Daniel 2,000 years earlier was fulfilled at exactly the correct time in earth history with exactly the effect it prophesied it would have. It is no coincidence, and God's truth was being restored after the men who rose up from the Roman Empire, adopting the Roman Emperor's titles, had for centuries distorted the message of the Messiah whilst claiming to be his representative. So where does all this leave us today? If during the mid-19th century, Yeshua began to end his work in the heavenly temple, the warning represented by the Feast of Trumpets has been given, and he had entered the most holy place for the investigative judgment to cleanse his people and sanctuary, then the next thing to happen is the harvest before the final Sabbath, when Christ rests from being our high priest working for our salvation. Remember, there is no long time gap between the Day of Atonement and Sukkot, as there was between the Spring Sabbath and the Autumn Sabbath. This indicate that we are now right at the end of the world's probation and the next great event is the second coming of Christ. In the last book of the Bible, it says that those ready for Christ's second coming have the identifying mark of keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. The discovery of the Ark of the Covenant with the blood of Yeshua on it is a perfect testimony to the world in the last days of this earth history. In both Revelation and in this discovery are represented Yeshua and the law together, which are the two marks of the true believers, showing the world what covenant Yeshua made, what law reveals us as sinners, and what sin we need to turn away from, 
and what law it is that will judge us if we don't seek salvation through Yeshua's blood. The ark in heaven and the ark on earth are both saying the same thing. And notice the ark on earth was not revealed until Yeshua had entered the most holy place in heaven. It was not revealed until after the time prophecy saying God would restore the truth, all a final witness to the main issue and the truth so long hidden. A last and final warning to the inhabitants of the world to receive Christ's warning before he returns. <laughs> 